Hello, this is uh, Art Talk, and I'm Rona Rutrick today talking about the Mashantucket Pequot tribe. For over 200 years, Euro-Americans all over our country did not know that the Mashantucket Pequots were alive and well on the reservation in Ledger, Connecticut. But for the last couple of years, everyone knows that they are alive and well. The Mashantucket Pequot reservation is the site of the Foxwoods Casino, and that has made everyone know that they're there. But more than gaming exists on the casino grounds. Art, a multi-million dollar collection of Native American art, already abounds in and around the hallways, the concourse of the casino and the hotel grounds. Um, and art is very much on the minds of the tribe uh, these days for a, a very large, very important Museum and Research Center is planned. I have guests today who will tell us all about those plans and the tribe as it exists today. Charlene Prince is the tribal librarian, and Dr. Kevin McBride is the tribal archaeologist. It's very nice to see you both. Thanks for coming nice to, to the you. studio. Thanks. Charlene, are you a tribal member? Yes, I'm a tribal member. How long have you been working with the tribe as a librarian? Uh, I've been working for the tribe uh, for about three years in the, as the tribal librarian. There's such excitement about the Museum and Research Center all over America, in the museum world, in the art world, everywhere, um, about what the plans are. Why is such an important uh, project on the table? Um, Native Americans in general, um, especially on the East Coast, um, it's very hard to find uh, research materials um, and this facility that we, we plan to open in 97, we hope will be um, the best resource or the best institution east of the Mississippi to be able to research uh, Native Americans, um, especially here on the East Coast. 
where a lot of the colonial records are gone or um, colonial records weren't taken down about the different tribes here except for diaries, overseers reports, wars, that sort of thing. Well, um, Kevin, very much of the resurrection of this culture um, that the historians and the librarians are going to uh, find and, and, and be able to show is under your aegis. How long have you been working uh, with the tribe? I've been working with the tribe <coughs> since about 1983, conducting various research projects to reconstruct the history of the tribe from the late prehistoric period through the 20th century. So is that the year that they became federally recognized? They became federally recognized in the fall of 1983. Yeah, and then uh, they were able to hire you um, as their archaeologist so that you could get this whole staffing done? Does the librarian and all of the staff in the library all work under your aegis? Well, there's, there's a collective effort uh, on the reservation referred to as the Mashantucket Pequot Ethno History Project, which consists of archaeological work, documentary research, and research in oral history and tradition. All of that information, all the various methods and techniques are designed to reconstruct the history of the tribe and to provide information um, to exhibit designers and museum personnel to design exhibits um, for the new facility. And as a result of that effort, the tribe has really, in the last five or ten years, made a very strong commitment to research for its own sake. And that's why there's such a strong emphasis on a library and archive in this new facility. I see. Um, I was at the uh, Cultural History Conference, uh, the second um, history conference, when Dr. Jack Campisi, who is uh, head of the research project, is, is that his title? Uh, Jack is one of three members of the Museum Liaison Committee, which ah. is charged by the Tribal Council with the uh, design and construction of the facility. Uh, the other two members are Teresa Bell, the tribe's public relations and cultural resources director, and myself. I see. So it's like a triumvirate. Of, right. Mm -hmm. You spoke there too, of course. But I remember uh, one of the things that he said was that there were four points um, of plan um, that the tribe was after once the federal recognition in 83 had been given. Um, and um, the research center is uh, is one of the points. Um, we'll go through those points in a moment. Let's take a look at the art that exists on the casino grounds now, and we'll talk about what they, that might say to all of the people in America about the arts of the Native Americans.
we're now looking at art that's in display cases uh, in the hotel. And this art is all for sale and done by contemporary artists and craftsmen of various tribes all over the country. This particular group here um, are showing baskets made um, in, in Maine by tribes that live there now. There's the logo um, on that drum of Foxwoods. You want to tell us something about the logo? Sure. Um, there are four unique symbols within the logo. The logo was designed by the tribal chairman in 1975, Richard Hayward. Uh, the um, fox that you see in the logo stands for the fox people. Uh, the knoll and the tree um, and the rocks represent Mashantucket. Mashantucket is a place name. Um, it's a Pequot word meaning much wooded land. And then the insignia that you see within the knoll is uh, the sign of Robin Cassis Cinnamon, who was the first sachem to lead up after the massacre that took place in Mystic. These are some Kachina dolls, and there are some pots, too, from southwestern tribes um, that are now using um, much of the traditional symbolism. There's a, a, a bone that's all been painted in the George O'Keefe style. Uh, but much of the contemporary craftsmen um, have taken on um, newer ways of showing the traditional styles, haven't they? They have. Um, there's also new, newer materials to be used uh, when doing art today than, than ever was before. Acrylics play a major part in painting those kachinas. They're quick drying, so they're able to mass produce them for sale. Each one's hand carved. And they come from the Navajo and the Hopi religion. Is that a storyteller doll? Yes, that's a Pueblo. Much of uh, the Native American um, look to arts and crafts these days is very stylish, wouldn't you say? Yes, very appealing to the eye. Um, it's a, a great expressionism in, in people today in their art. Uh, with the materials they use um, to uh, the construction of, of major pieces of work like the sculptures. These pieces um, are all for sale, and if um, a visitor to Foxwoods likes something, I suppose that there's a way that they can make some arrangement to, to make a purchase. Yeah, uh, through Sandy Daggett, she's the um, tribal person down there, along with uh, Joyce Walker, who is in charge of buying uh, or purchasing uh, Native American arts and crafts. Um, through the uh, gift, gift shop, either across from the museum on uh, the lower level of the casino or um, through one of the stores in the Concord of the casino as well. So traditional feathers and traditional symbols and traditional um, uh, kachina dolls are all there. Along with jewelry, um, silversmithing, goldsmithing. There are the blankets that show all the symbols, and I guess um, that is a very popular item that many um, Americans from all kinds of backgrounds enjoy decorating their homes with. Um, now, with the various art that we've been seeing, both here in the display and the art that we saw that is uh, large sculptures in the casinos, um, uh, Kevin, how do uh, the, this kind of idea um, show us something about the Native American tribes? Well, the, it's an expression of um, cultural values. It's an expression of uh, social values and social connections. So from my perspective, um, there's certainly an aesthetic quality that's very important. But as an anthropologist, we tend to look at uh, what that art tells us about the people who created it in terms of their social, political, economic connections and values um, and information like that. So from that perspective, even the contemporary art is beginning to tell us that a lot of the, there's becoming uh, a more common basis 
for a lot of creation of this art. There's a lot of shared values across, uh, across the country, in Indian country, that we haven't really seen in the Native art work from hundreds of years ago. Well, but um, the art that we see that's all over the, the concourse um, of the casino is both um, traditional kind of art and a little bit of the abstract from Bruce LaFontaine's uh, grouping uh, that his is more abstract than Alan Hauser's work. Um, who are those artists and, and how are they chosen? Do either of you know who does that? I don't. That would come through the purchasing down at the um, casino. Um, it's based on um, knowledge of that artist, um, particular history with his artwork or her artwork, um, the size of the piece, the price. Those all, all take into play as to who, you know, if they're going to purchase that, that particular piece, um, either for display or for resale at the shop. Now, the, there's a purpose for that, though. The purpose, as I understand it, is so that we all get the feelings and the spirit of the Native American, even though we're in a gaming hall. What, what, the real bottom line is that we should get the ideas and the, I, the, the, the ideologies, the spirit of what the Native Americans are about through the disclosure of art. Yes? Yes. Um, very much uh, looking at the art. Um, art has become a way of expressing oneself um, and being able for someone to, to actually um, look and touch at uh, one's expression. And native, art is another statement of we're here and we've managed to survive and we're prospering. We're prospering through our art. Well, we're going to, um, after a two-minute break, look at uh, plans for the museum. And we'll then talk, if you would, about how this idea is going to really be put forth to retell the story of the Mash and Tucker Pequots and underscore the arts of all the tribal nations in America. We'll break for two minutes for a commercial arts break, and then we'll be back. Art is a process that fills our lives. See it. Enjoy it. This public service announcement is brought to you by the Griffiths Art Center, New London, Connecticut. We're back in the studio with Charlene Prince, the tribal librarian, and Kevin McBride, the tribal archaeologists, uh, talking about um, the new museum that is planned for the Mashantucket Pequot um, Nation. Um, how is this uh, museum going to uh, fit into the reservation? Is it going to be built right on the reservation? Uh, 
the, mu the museum will be built on the reservation, on tribal trust lands, on a portion of the reservation that's adjacent to the Great Cedar Swamp. And we'll be able to get there from place to place. Is there a monorail planned? There's a monorail being planned. Uh, one of the things we're trying to achieve here is to minimize any uh, impact to the environment. And one way to do that is to um, park off-site and get people there through other means. And the monorail will be a fairly significant uh, way of doing that. I see. So that, all of that is an ecological plan um, as far as the monorail is concerned. Sure. Yeah. To achieve that and also to begin the museum experience for the people before they get to the museum. We'll route the monorail through various portions of um, various habitats in the swamp to give people a glimpse of of what those environments look like and why they're so important to the Pequots, uh, while at the same time minimizing the damage and the impact. That's a wonderful idea. Let's take a look at the display that now sits on the concourse in the Foxwoods Casino that shows us what the plan is uh, for the museum. Here's a three-dimensional display, um, and there's the laser uh, Indian, the rainmaker in the background, um, that is on a timing computer situation with sound and light. A, uh, from what I understand, it goes off every eight minutes of the hour. Wow. I mean, every hour, eight minutes. It's eight minutes long. I'm sorry. <clears throat> oh, I see. You notice that there are people everywhere. Um, and we'll see that in all of our video that we've taken. Although we were um, shooting um, rather early-ish in the morning and then later mid-morning, um, people are all over the casino. Uh, uh, Foxwoods seems to be busy at all times. And the people are milling in and around all the artwork all the time. Now, tell us what this is. There are two models there. Uh, the one you're looking at now, um, the one you were just looking at, is a, is a design of the building. And the second model is a conceptual design for the exhibits. Uh, we, in the planning of this facility, we felt that there are primarily two functions. One, we wanted to get the story of the Pequots out to the general public. And secondly, we wanted to create a world-class research facility. But we felt the content of the exhibits and the story was paramount. That was the, the first and foremost, our most important task. So we designed the exhibits first and then put the building around the exhibits. Oh. So the design that you see really follows from our primary concern with the exhibitry and the orientation. And the building consists of about 305,000 square feet of which about 90,000 square feet will be exhibits, and the remainder will be uh, a research facility consisting of um, 150,000 volume library archive, archaeology labs, conservation labs, public programming, children's libraries, uh, and administrative support. I see. Will the public be invited to participate educationally and um, voyeuristically, really, in, in learning about the uh, Native Americans in this facility? Definitely, definitely. Uh, the children's portion of the library uh, um, is very, very important in, one, in many, many reasons why, but uh, one of the biggest reasons is that we want to tie it in with the uh, museum and the programs they have there with the museum. Uh, the library, the children's portion will be uh, lending so that this way children in the local area um, can learn about Pequots um, and other Native Americans from this area um, and have first-hand knowledge. Um, they'll be able to tour the museum, they'll be able to use the library, they'll be able to borrow materials. Teachers in this area will be able to come and uh, do research here so that they can do their curriculum plans when teaching about Native Americans. Um, it looks as if there's going to be a lot of electronically sophisticated uh, use in the way in which you're going to teach about items. Is that so? Oh, yeah. Um, Kevin could talk more about that specifically. There's going to be a, a pretty heavy emphasis on interactive videos and um, some fairly sophisticated technology exhibitry 
in terms of the exhibitry. One, one thing we suffer from, which may be an advantage in this case, is we're artifact poor, but concept rich. We have a very important, rich story to tell, whereas a lot of other museums and facilities have a lot of artifacts, but may not have a story to go, go with them. So we're placing much more of an emphasis on content, and through our research with other, in other facilities, we've discovered that um, you're much more effective telling a story if it can be part entertainment and part education. And there may be a fine line between that, but we think we've managed to achieve that. Sure. I think, too, it's very important to uh, have somebody interested and engaged in what it is you want to tell them, and then perhaps they'll listen and learn. Let's go back to the studio. Um, uh, we, we've seen these wonderful displays. Tell me, who's put these displays together? The Tribal Council has hired um, a museum design firm out of New York. Uh, called DMCD, and this is a team of individuals who are designing and doing research for the exhibitry. Um, the exhibits themselves tell the story of the Pequots from about 10,000 years ago to the present. And the architect? James Polchek and partners from New York. So we have already the um, architect uh, is not only in place, but the design is done. Um, and he will continue to work uh, as the plan for setup gets closer to uh, fruition. What date are we talking about? We're entering the, the schematic design phase of the architectural design right now. So he's still working? Still working. We've just finished the programming portion, and we expect to open probably late 96 or early 97. I see. And so he work, does he work hand in hand with the DMCD group? Uh, the, the, they're in charge of the interior, and he's in charge pretty much of the exterior? The exterior as well as the support and um, mechanical systems. And both of those work with the Museum Liaison Committee and um, Charlene in terms of the library. There's a very constant flow of information and exchange that goes on. I see. Now, where do you work, Kevin? Are you involved in outdoors and digs? Uh, as much as I can, it's not as much as I'd like to these days, but uh, we have a very active archaeology program on the reservation um, throughout most of the year, most intensive during the summer months when the college students uh, provide uh, most of the labor and research personnel. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to take a look at some things that have been found, um, perhaps some of them among your digs and some of them uh, in uh, requests for people to look through their collections of things um, to see what, what kinds of things the Mashantucket Pequots had in their civilization so many years ago when that area was rich and full of tribal members. Um, let's take a look now at the, um, what we found in the library. <coughs> this is the start of our collection here. Um, We've been continuing uh, purchasing of materials and locating um, out-of-print materials, rare materials, uh, for several years now. Um, we're in the process of moving uh, to a bigger facility, so what you see right now is uh, we're going through our items and, and trying to pack. We've actually blown the walls out on this library here. Um, so we're in the process of moving. In the <laughs> Moving the library is pretty, pretty I hard. wanted to come to the library and do some study on a particular item or a particular time. Um, would I be allowed to come and, and do some research? Sure. We are a public library. Um, because we are a special library, uh, we ask people to call and make an appointment. Um, because we are the walking catalogs, uh, we are not automated at this point. Um, what are we looking at here? Right here, uh, you're looking at... Um, reconstruction of some funerary objects that were found um, during a 1990 excavation for a home and whereas a uh, Pequot cemetery was um, disturbed and these items were discovered and uh, with the students up at uh, Yukon working under Kevin um, reconstructed um, the artifacts 
that were found there. Um, not with the exact materials uh, in all of the items, but they are reconstructed uh, with warped and wept of the, uh, the beads there. That, what you, that particular piece in the center has over a thousand wampum beads, both white and purple. Now, Kevin, do you mean to tell me that this stuff, the, these, these were funerary pieces found in, um, in a dig? That's right. Tell me, where, what, how? Um, as Charlene had said, in 1990, there was, uh, during the construction of a house, uh, during the excavation of foundation, a, uh, a cemetery unknown to us was accidentally disturbed during the construction process, and a tribal council authorized the removal of those burials that were in most immediate danger of destruction from erosion or additional excavation. I see. So with the assistance of the tribe and many tribal members, Charlene worked with us throughout the project, we removed, studied, and reburied those objects. But prior to reburial, we took great pains to replicate, and I'd say those replications are probably 90 to 100 percent accurate, mm -hmm. um, those objects, simply because of the tribe's interest and our perception that they were important. They were visual representations of the richness of the culture that sure. very few of us had ever seen before nor even realized. Uh, and I think it's a testament not only to the richness of the culture, but the, uh, the importance of these objects in the culture as well as their importance as an art form. Um, we'll get back to that in a minute. Tell us about the baskets now that we're looking at. Do these baskets, um, during the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, splint baskets were produced by most of the native tribes in the Northeast. And while splint basketry probably, they are found in prehistory, they became more common in a way in which tribal members to obtain, um, basically to earn some money. And there are many tales of Charlene's great-grandmother, for example, making baskets throughout the winter and then during the, uh, the summertime walking between Norwich and London, Stonington, selling 50 to 100 baskets that she carried um, on, the back, uh, on her back. But these... Stressed all over her body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and where were these found? They come out of a lot of local barns, uh, households. They're utilitarian. They're functional. I see. And they're incorporated, and there's a number of native designs that you can see that's incorporated into the design. Uh huh. Those are the, those are potato stencils that are decorating the the baskets right there. Mm hmm. Uh, using a potato, a design was cut into the potato, and then dipped into um, a dye, a native Colored dye, dye. Mm -hmm. sure, and then placed on the potato. Used as decoration. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's very interesting, and what's particularly wonderful about those baskets is that um, these baskets represent an art form that was done right here with the Mashantucket Pequots as they lived um, in the early 18th century, up until the early 18th century? Is that when those baskets uh, were really prevalent? Um, yes, I would believe so, believe so um, because it was an, an, an economical, excuse me, economical reason. At the time many men had left the reservation uh, for fishing, um, for the military, and those sort of things, and the women were left on the reservation to care for their children, um, and there was no economic development on the reservation, so they used their crafts, they sold their crafts um, for money so that they could support their families while the men were away. So the things that we've seen now, in the last few minutes, the jewelry that has been um, remade really to look almost exactly alike the real goods which you then reburied the, the originals yes that's to protect the honor and and uh, dignity of, of of the real item they were with the bodies is in the dig is that what you found yes these mm -hmm. were these were grave goods that were with the body mm -hmm. um, did you have to get permission to when you brought that up to keep them out and, and analyze these pieces? Is that how it, you go about it? Permission from the tribal, the tribal council um, has complete, had complete control over the process in this case. Whatever they allowed us to do, we did. They gave us very st few stipulations. They recognized that they could learn a lot, but at the same time they wanted to return these uh, individuals to the earth as quickly as possible. So. 
It was about an 18-month process and probably one of the most complex um, analyses that uh, we've ever engaged in. Charlene was involved through most of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so this is, um, you are a, a professor of anthropology at, at UConn right. when you're not working on the tribal reservation as the arch archaeologist, but um, archaeology and anthropology together is what you're using to resurrect the culture of the Mashantaka Pequots? Right. Anthropology is the study of people. What archaeology does is it's really just a series of techniques and methods to reconstruct the past using material objects. We reconstruct um, the history, behavior, cultural traditions of the, of the tribe that is not necessarily reflected in documents and not necessarily reflected in oral histories. The three together provide us with a fairly uh, rich history of the tribe. Now, so what we've seen today is um, art forms that um, represent many different tribes. For instance, the things that are in the casino, uh, the wonderful sculptures, the things that are in the cases. Those are items from tribes, not necessarily Mashantuck at Pequot, but those other tribes that many of us kind of know as Southwestern Indian items, yes? Um, I wouldn't say all Southwestern. Um, there's some things that, uh, in there like chokers, bone chokers and that sort of thing that have been made um, by the Ojibwe people, um, by East, you know, uh, Eastern tribes here. But um, they're from various tribes. Yeah, they're and from all over. What I mean to ask you is, in the museum, will there be both the <coughs> Meshantucket Pequot civilization as you refined it, and, and reteach it and, re, and give, almost give it back to the people, really, who, who haven't been able to uh, uh, nourish themselves with their own tribe um, until recently. And also the tribes, will all of that be in the museum? Yeah, I mean, you can't tell the history of the Pequots with, without telling the history of a lot of other people, um, not only local, regionally, but across the country. When we talk about national, the Pequots, in the context of today, we need to talk about national native issues. So the, the museum then will incorporate the um, art and culture, both of the Mashantucket Pequots and the tribes all over the nation as they bespeak their culture, too. To an extent, mm -hmm. with the primary focus, of course, on the Mashantucket Pequot in the context of the Eastern Woodland culture. And the Eastern Woodland culture. Well, I think that if, if anyone watching hasn't yet been to the Foxwoods Reservation to at least see the buildings that are up and the art collection that has been collected, perhaps now that they've gotten an idea of what's there, they will be able to go down and have an idea of what to look for and to spend some time looking for the, at least the pieces that we've shown them exist. And we certainly are looking forward to knowing more and more about the museum and the research center as you go through your work um, doing the detailed digs and the anthropological searches and the library searches of the Mashantucket Pequots so that that will all become available for all of us to know and enjoy and love. Thank you so much for coming to the studio and talking about the Mashantucket Pequot and the museum that you're planning. Thank you. Thank we'll you. see you again next week on Art Talk. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.